Yes, thanks AIG for inviting me to give this talk. We're, um, so I've got a lot of slides to go through. Um, I've got the first part is really to talk about spectral mineralogy. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, um, I'm just going to go through some background and about what's, where it's come from really over the last 30 years. And then part two will be, uh, I'll be looking at in more detail about uh, handheld spectrometers and uh, the data that we can get from them and uh, where we are at uh, currently with, with that technology. So uh, infrared spectral mineralogy, I think um, those of you that have come across it over the years, it is uh, always, we're promoting it as a, a way of uh, getting fast and easy mineral information from the spectra. Um, with the spectral mineralogy we can not only get uh, alteration mineral information but we're basically looking at um, the information that beyond the visible so uh, you'll be able to see a lot of things that you can log in in your samples but uh, the the spectral data looks into the infrared part of the spectrum where you're you're actually getting additional information that you just can't see by eye it's a, an objective method as well so um, like x-ray diffraction it's giving you mineral information that's not dependent on the expertise of the uh, geologist um, but best of all, I suppose, is that it's non-destructive, so you can just make a measurement directly on the sample surface without necessarily uh, going through any sample preparation. The other thing as well is that you can look at cryptic zonation, such as uh, alteration, uh, sorry, such as uh, compositional variations in certain minerals and crystallinity variations, and that can give us really useful data for uh, vectoring into um, different uh, parts of your alteration system. And when you're doing with image uh, data, you can actually also look at textural uh, and uh, look at um, various information that you can get from the image data. And again, uh, this is available at all stages of the exploration and mining cycle. So just to give you a little bit of background about where this comes from. So the technology basically is looking at uh, uh, the infrared response, uh, the visible near-infrared and shortwave infrared response of uh, your samples. And uh, there's different things happening in different parts of the spectra. So, um, that, no, it doesn't work, the pointer. Um, so, first we have the, what's known as the VNIR, or the visible near infrared. This goes from uh, around about 380 um, nanometers to 1300 nanometers. This part of the spectrum, what we're detecting there are uh, vib uh, transitions um, within the um, uh, subatomic transitions, basically. So, it's where uh, the, uh, you get jumps in energy levels um, within the, um, the elements. Um, so what's happening is it's absorbing the energy from the, the light and uh, causing these energy jumps. And that results in um, absorption features. Just get those up. Uh, so that are relate to the wavelengths where we're getting these uh, energy absorptions. When we go into the shortwave infrared and also into the mid and thermal infrared, we're looking at uh, molecular vibrations rather than subatomic um, transitions. So, um, and there the, uh, we've got bending and stretching of the molecular bonds that are absorbing certain energies of light. Uh, and this, these absorptions happen at characteristic wavelengths that result in a char characteristic signature for each of your um, minerals in your sample. So. Um, just going through quickly how the process happens. So when you're dealing with spectral reflectance, usually the spectrometers have got an internal light source which shine on the surface of the sample. Um, that light will interact with the, uh, your material within the top 30 to 100 microns of your sample, and then the remaining light will be reflected. And so uh, with the interaction uh, with your surface sample, uh, you actually end up with the absorption features relating to the minerals that are present within that layer. So the minerals that we're identifying in the visible near-infrared, because we're looking at uh, the subatomic transitions, we're basically getting information on the transition elements. Um, commonly, iron dominates this, this part of the spectrum. So obviously, we get responses for the iron oxides in this part of the spectrum, for hematite and girthite but also other minerals that have got iron in them, such as um, jarosite, iron carbonate, chlorite, epidote, amphibole, and tourmaline. They all have responses in this part of the spectrum. In other cases, we'll also be able to pick out uh, responses associated with copper, moly, m uh, manganese, and chrome, as well if the iron is not dominating this part of the spectrum. So you can get quite a lot of information from this region. When we go into the shortwave infrared, what we're detecting here are um, vibrations associated with water and hydroxyl 
carbonate and ammonium as well. And uh, so the minerals that we can detect in this part of the spectrum are dominantly uh, your hydroxylated silicates, hydrothermal minerals, carbonates, uh, and also minerals with ammonium in them. Um, so this leads us to a whole suite of, of hydrothermal alteration minerals. So this is the part of the spectrum that's really ideal for uh, mapping out different uh, alteration zones. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, this is really the, where it all started in the early days, was um, this capability. So the, uh, just on the, underneath the, that little cartoon of the electromagnetic spectrum, I've got the, uh, the wavelength range for the TerraSpec, which is a spectrometer that's most commonly used. And we also have uh, the high loggers as well. The high logger 2 has the visible near infrared, short wave infrared, and the high logger 3s have got the thermal um, as well coming in. And the thermal wavelengths, this is where we get some of the, uh, the fundamental vibration features. Uh, so what we're seeing in the short wave infrared are basically harmonics or overtones uh, and combinations of what we see in the thermal. But in the thermal, this is where we can detect all the things that we can see in the short wave infrared but also uh, we're looking at anhydrous minerals such as the feldspars and quartz um, and peroxines and so on. And we can also start to pull apart different types of feldspars. If we've got like a really good spectral response, um, we can detect different types of feldspars and garnets and peroxines as well in this part of the spectrum. There's not so many spectrometers that can give us a response in this region. How am I doing for time? Helen, can you actually just, uh, so I don't have a little clock. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, good. Okay. All right. So, um, where it all started? So, I think spectral geology really started in the, the 70s and 80s with the remote sensing, um, the growth in remote sensing in those times where we had some the satellites, the Landsat sat satellites up there. Um, and as part of that, people uh, developed field portable spectrometers to go down on the ground and do ground truth things so that they could actually look at the responses of the materials that they were detecting in the remote sensing images and to see and understand more about what was happening on the ground. Um, and from that developed some additional spectrometers like the PIMA where these actually allow people to go into the core shed. So they're the ground truthing spectrometers generally work off uh, solar illumination, so they are usually set up about a meter above the ground and they've got quite a wide field of view, um, but they rely on, on the sun. But the uh, newer spectrometers that we have from about the early 90s to present day have got internal light source, so they're not reliant on the solar illumination. But the promise then when these were developed is that uh, the accessibility to easy, cheap and uh, fast um, mineralogy from these type spectrometers. So briefly on the satellite uh, and the airborne responses, uh, so basically the, these technology um, where the satellites in the early stages of this, this technology, they were uh, very much dependent on, um, this has got a point. doesn't matter. Um, if you look on the lower part here, we've got the, uh, some absor absorption bands. I'm actually not sure what spectrometer this is from, but basically the, the satellite um, were multi-spectral spectrometers, so they work across really broad absorption bands. So you get maybe set, um, the Landsat with seven different bands across uh, the, the, sh the visible to shortwave infrared. So really all you would get is just whether the sample was bright or dark in that part of the spectrum due to the absorptions, but you couldn't actually see the features themselves. Then when we went to the airborne systems like uh, Avaris and the HiMapper, um, they allow us then to have contiguous spectral bands and the term hyperspectral uh, was coined in those days and they cover the full uh, sh visible to shortwave infrared part of the spectrum. And in these, you're starting to get some mineral features and starting to get more information in the spectra. The only thing that affects the, uh, these remote sensing um, instruments is that you, they're actually sensing through the atmosphere. So we have uh, the atmospheric absorption bands, mostly due to water, but also um, we have CO2 bands as well that uh, take some of the information out. So the water bands, uh, are completely um, absorbed completely across that part of the spectrum. So we're not getting any information uh, for the minerals in those parts of the spectra. So we have to focus on the windows that we can see things. So there's an example here from an Avarice survey where um, they were using the data. So I'm not sure how well it 
projects to the back, but uh, basically the colours just represent different minerals, and so they were starting to pull apart different minerals uh, in the remote sensing images and creating um, um, areas to actually go down on the ground and do the ground truthing. But then in the early 90s, uh, the Pima spectrometer came on the scene, and this really was a, a paradigm shift uh, for the, uh, the industry. It had an internal light source. It wasn't a very pretty spectrometer, but it was extremely good uh, for you know, at that time. And uh, so it meant that people could actually take it to the core shed, so you didn't, didn't have to uh, uh, use a solar illumination. You could actually use a spectrometer anywhere, and it was pretty portable as well. Unfortunately, the PIMAs are not made anymore, but uh, we now have uh, spectrometers such as the, the TerraSpec, so uh, the TerraSpec, the field specs, and the HALO uh, spectrometers, which all have internal light sources, uh, and there's also the spectral evolution spectrometers as well. And um, this means that the, the spectrometers are available to take into the core shed. What I want to do now is just a, a quick uh, farewell to uh, one of the key people who actually was involved with the Pima, um, the growth of the Pima, she was around in the 80s and 90s very extensively. I'm not sure how many of you actually know her, but Phoebe, she was uh, yeah, the Pima pioneer for uh, this technology. And this is, she really was uh, the person who started it all. So sadly, she passed away last Friday. So um, yeah, just sort of put it up there. I'm not sure whether, any pe whether there's many people in the audience that actually know her. <coughs> Okay, um, moving on with um, the spectral, geol um, spectral mineralogy, we're able to identify different minerals and the uh, hydrothermal alteration minerals, but we're also able to uh, detect some uh, subtle um, variations within certain mineral groups. So, for example, we're able to detect variations in compositions of the white micas and the chlorites and also alienite, among other minerals. Um, from looking at the wavelength variations of the features for these minerals. And we can also look at crystallinity variations, which are important for uh, kaolinites when we're detecting um, kaolinite crystallinity um, in, through the regolith. So certainly here in Australia, it's a key characteristic to help us identify when we have transported overburden or whether we're in the uh, residual basement. Um, in other environments, the crystallinity of kaolinite can actually allow us to detect hydrothermal kaolinite compared to weathering kaolinite. Uh, and crystallinity of the white micas also is a key characteristic which allows us to look at th temperature variations within some alteration systems. So this information allow, gives you much more in-depth data for your uh, alteration system. You can look at the history of the alteration and uh, even develop vectors towards mineralization using this information. So just taking the white micas as an example, um, we can use the white mica ALOH absorption, which is a diagnostic white mica absorption in the shortwave infrared. And the wavelength of this varies specifically depending on the white mica chemistry. And so we can take the wavelength of that feature and then map it out um, in, we can model it in 3D, we can look at it as a, as a plan view, and it helps us start to unravel what's happened uh, with the white mica alteration history through a project area. <clears throat> so to do that, we, um, so what I've shown here is basically you take that wavelength and you report it as a numerical value. And then as a numerical value, you can use that information the same way as you would geochemistry. So the one of the groundbreaking um, projects, as I think this was in the 90s, um, by Plasser, um, Scott Halley and, and his team. They took uh, a whole series of uh, thousands of end of hole RAB samples uh, on a regional scale and, and just basically looked at the white micas for those samples and they mapped out, uh, this, so this is around the KB marks Cambalda, so, um, no, sorry, Canal Nobel. So this is the Canal Nobel pit um, and you can see that we have got a very distinctive uh, um, longer wavelengths, white micas shown in red here. The pragonitic white micas are shown in the blues, uh, and the muscovites are shown in the greens and yellows. So we've got a very distinct regional footprint for the Canal de Bell um, area, it was shown by these end of hole samples. And these are all done just with a PEMA spectrometer and just point <coughs> reading. So nothing really fancy, um, but obviously very effective. And this really got people thinking about the potential of the technology. 
So nowadays, the options that we have, uh, we have uh, the ter various Terraspec uh, spectrometers, Terraspec 4 and, and high res the Terraspec Halo, and the Aura Express spectrometers. So these for, for our handheld options. Um, the Terraspec Halo is becoming very popular these days because it's very easy to use. Uh, the High Logger provides us with uh, automated measurements of, of core trays and chip trays as well. Uh, and we still have the High Logger 2s and the High Logger 3s. Um, I think the, all the geological surveys have got the High Logger 3s now, haven't you, with the thermal as well. And then, of course, there's the core imaging uh, groups like CoreScan and TerraCore who are doing, uh, basically, uh, they've brought the remote sensing spectrometers down to the core tray now. So we're getting images of, um, oh, there we go, uh, images of the, uh, the core trays. And this is where they basically, each of the core trays is made up of millions of tiny pixels, and each one of those pixels has a spectrum in it. So um, they're able to separate out different minerals and develop mineral maps of uh, core tray, your, your core samples in, in the tray. <clears throat> okay, so that's pretty much that demystifying bit. So hopefully that covers a bit of background for all of you about where it's all come from. Um, very much a flyover and not a lot of detail, so I apologize if I've missed anything out. <laughs>